still doing our home editions, which is all good fun. And it's always great to have great guests. And this time around, we have a friend from previous shows that we did. I think you'll remember way back we did a show with Joe Sidhu QC and Jatinda was on as well. And we were talking about the challenges at the time in terms of COVID-19. Well, today we're going to talk about a different subject, something that's very close to Jatinda's heart. In actual fact, it's so much close to his heart that he uh, got a few degrees in it and then he started up his own company to focus on the digital side of business, digital strategies. So I was going to introduce you very quickly. Jatinda, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you, Savi. Good to see you. And um, we want to talk about... <laughs> it's always good, man. Um, how's the cycle riding going? Good? I've <laughs> been a bit quiet on that side at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things that we should share with the viewers is that you also look after the CharityBikeRide.com website, as well as being a cyclist. And you did the website, which was Challenge for Heroes, which was a great piece of work. You did really well. You did the registration pages, uh, the tracking and everything else. But more about that in a minute. So we want to talk about three things today. First of all, uh, digital product strategy. Why is it important? You can't just get a website and blog to your heart's content. There was obviously a strategy behind that. And then the second question really is like more around, there are millions of websites, literally, right? And there are millions of people shouting. I remember when I first started doing podcasting back in 2004, people said, you mean, what's a podcast? And now people are saying to me, how do I start a podcast? Um, but again, there's no point in having a podcast unless you have it connected to, say, like a product ladder or some kind of strategy for your business, or you just like talking, like me. <laughs> um, and then there's, there's also the third part, which I wanted to talk to you about. Can you give us some, you know, case studies of where you've worked and you've seen uh, a digital strategy actually work? So let, let's kick off, first of all, digital strategy. You love it so much that you've created your company um, I think you've got Digital Rapport and you've got BigFanta.com. Tell us all about the great work that you're doing in your own company to help promote digital strategies. I mean, Seat Channel's got a digital strategy. They've got a website. They've got a really fantastic um, YouTube channel where they've got millions of people uh, appearing. Um, but they need people to keep it going, don't they? That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, so Big Fant is um, uh, basically one of my original company, which is a production house. It's going to be 15 years this year. Um, that's how long we've been at it. And then the digital report side of it is basically um, kind of customer facing. It's more to do training and education and um, educating people around digital strategy and things like that. So um, with the uh, like Big Fanta, it's about working with local businesses, um, but I, I've specialized it to the personal development and uh, business niche. So working with like authors, entrepreneurs, life coaches, what we call subject matter experts, and basically uh, getting them online and getting their message out there and then helping them train others or helping them basically uh, change lives in, in, what, uh, in, in helping other people with what, you know, break, breakthroughs in life or business. They must struggle though, because uh, that marketplace is massive. You know, every Tom, Dick, Harry, and Jane thinks they're a coach, and I'm sure I'm not knocking the fact that they are. Uh, but you know, it's a difficult market to be in. Um, I, I met somebody recently who was saying to me that they'd only had a couple of years' experience in business, but they wanted to become a life coach. I'm, mm. I'm not knocking that, but it, it's interesting that maybe sometimes people are good at you know teaching or uh, making sure people follow a particular a path of self-improvement, but it's a particular niche, like you said, right? But they will all have the same. They've got to be digital savvy these days, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's an interesting stuff because with um, when we talk about uh, like coaches and stuff, I mean, originally the reason I got involved with all of that was because I was learning about personal development and mindset and all that, going to these trainings and meeting fantastic people. And there was one uh, one event, one of my friends turned around and said, why are you learning all this stuff? Are you thinking about being a coach yourself? And I said, I don't know. I'm, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a, a digital marketing background. Um, I like personal development. I like what it's about. I've got the skills. And maybe I could go in that direction. And he said something to me which made me 
basically dropped my jaw. Yeah, he said, L- "Listen, if you're gonna go into life coaching, just make sure you know one thing, and that's how to basically make money in that industry." He said, "Because a lot of life coaches, they're brilliant at what they do, but they're broke." <laughs> that's what he said to me. This guy was a business mentor, coach himself, so that kind of hurt. Like these people are fantastic, right? So why are they in that kind of situation? Um, and that's basically what got me going in that direction, saying, "Well." Um, I, I want to basically serve that industry and help those people basically get their message out. So we're talking about the people who have got the skills and knowledge. They are very good at what they do. And um, and then just giving them the helping hand to get out there, right? And helping them get their voice heard. So that thing that you said about, um, is it noisy? Uh, the thing is, if if there's competition in that industry, that means there's 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 money to be made. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big industry. I mean, you take the web design industry, for example, it's massive. And it's going to be 15 years for myself being in this industry um, to, to some degree. So it's not really about um, the, the industry or the competition itself. It's more about how you serve your uh, people, how you serve um, and help them get results. And then that customer service element and used to utilizing that to then possibly get referrals and stuff. And that's a very good um, addition to anything that anybody's doing digitally online as well, is that never forget that human side, you know, that one-to-one connection with people, because that's what's going to take you forward in um, just growing your business overall. So, you know, when you look at social media channels, right, you would have Twitter, now people got WhatsApp, now they've got TikTok, <laughs> people do stuff on TikTok. Now uh, Instagram have got Reels, which is kind of a competition with, I think it is to a certain extent with TikTok. Um, then you've got Twitter, you know, and then you've got Facebook. Uh, I mean, there's so many different ways to connect to your um, your client base, right? But should it be clear and concise in terms of your, you know, what you're about? Because you know, look at this thing called the product ladder, where you say, well, I've got a book, then I've got a series of seminars, and then I've got a series of training courses, um, and then you have all this kind of like you know, nonsense where you'll watch an advert and people just go on about, on and on about, you should do this, 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 but it's all the content, but but none of the substance. And the only mm-hmm. reason you get the substance is if you part with your money. Uh, mm-hmm. And whereas the clever people are sometimes people that give uh, tasters away, you know, so that people can feel that, yes, it would be something that would help them. Is that a better way to go down? And then isn't it more difficult when you've got all the different social media channels to choose from. And then so you've got, very, we had Am, very, we, Am, she's into PR, uh, and mm-hmm. she, she, you know, you believe you've got to have a good PR strategy. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, the, the thing is, right, when it comes to social media, there's so many different channels. Uh, but what happens is because people look at other people, it, it's a bit of a, unfortunately, in some cases, a bit of a herd mentality as well, because they see everybody else jumping on these different platforms and they think, oh, they're doing it, so I must do it, you know, and they all jump on, they do things, they're constantly creating content, constantly adding to the noise and they're not getting any results. Um, it's because it is a very noisy market. And now the thing is, you could go out there, increase your Twitter followers and all that kind of st- thing, right? But if there's no strategy behind it and how you capture those people and how you actually then serve those people, then it's just noise adding to noise. And that's that's not really a, a good thing to do. So, um, yeah, and, and especially nowadays, because there's so many people coming online, there's so much more noise, it is becoming a lot harder to kind of... Um, you know, break through that noise. But that's one of the reasons why that human connection element is something that should never be forgotten. Now, it's one thing to be online and, you know, doing Twitter and all these kind of things, but to actually get on a conversation and chat to people, it's, it's sometimes it's considered old school, but it's the best, it's evergreen, right? Um, so the key focus is that anytime you're out there marketing, doing anything, um, why are you doing that marketing in the first place, right? Um, are you just adding to the noise or have you actually got something that can help other people in in that particular niche that you're going to be in? And if you have got something, then your key focus should be to get on a conversation with them so you can chat to them and figure out what problems they have and then provide the solution to that problem. And when, you, when you've got that thing where you talked about a product ladder, basically what that means is the ability to have an offer at different points of the customer's journey in their life cycle. 
right? So some people are going to be ready for your products or services. Some people are not. Some people are going to be searching for that particular thing. And some people have even heard about it. So having like a, a complete kind of cycle. So what you call like, a, you know, a cold market, a warm market and a hot market and being able to target each one of those markets with what they need at that moment in time in their journey is the best way to actually be uh, pattern interrupting and getting people at the, at the right phrase. So if you've got the product ladder, that basically means you've got an offering for each of those people, right? So to give you an example is that you might get, um, I don't know, a double glazing company, right? As, as just some, some totally random double glazing company, right? And they, are going to have, um, you know, you, you, the only time you're going to use a double glazing company is if you need to replace your windows, right? Or something smashes or you got a new build going on. So there's certain, certain things that have to take place in order for you to get, uh, you know, in touch with a double glazing company. But say you're, a, um, say you got, you're a mind co mindset coach. Um, then when you initially have content out there, people may not need your services because for example, someone who's helping people with depression, let's just take depression. If you're not depressed, you're not going to go for those services, right? So, but if you've created content, which somebody's come across, um, and then unfortunately at some point in your life, you find yourself in a depressive state, then that's going to come into your mind thinking, hang on a minute. I saw this video. I saw this person who talk dealing about depression. Maybe that's who I should reach out to. So it's very important to kind of understand your target audience and where they are on that, what we call customer buying decision or buying journey. Um, and that's how we should be looking at what we're doing with social media, what products and services we're offering and how we can get it out to the right people with the right message. Do you think that there, uh, there's a danger? I mean, see, one thing things you could look at is the dangers in the past of networking, you know, you know, like people turn up to a, a conference uh, when they did and then they network and you'd go, I'd been to one or two and then the only people that actually were there were other people trying to sell their services. There weren't actually any real customers. And so the targeting aspect where you're, you know, where you were talking about, you know, kind of being with that prospect, you could call it, or eventually that prospect will become a customer. The networking conferences just seem to talk about product. They don't seem to be centered on, uh, you know, a customer or a series of customers that have been invited who are looking for your service. So mm -hmm. I'm not belittling it too much, but a lot of networking seems to be time wasting um, around discussions <laughs> of what could be rather than what is. You know, no, you, uh, you know, it's a very. Good I, could, I could do that. I could have that person. But hang on a second. I'm trying to find the person. Oh, I'm trying to find the same person as you are, which is ultimately the customer. No, that's true. It's true. I mean, um, it it really depends on the kind of networking that's taking place, right? Because um, if if you're a business coach or um, you you and you put on an event, then the chances are the people attending that event are going to be people who are interested in your services and products. And that when if people are there and then they're networking with each other, that's that's a different kind of thing. But if it's like a general networking event, you're right. You're going to get all sorts of people who turn up, um, but. Here's, here's the key, though. When you do networking events, the, the idea, I reckon, is, is that not to come in from a sales angle in the first place. It's, it's about creating network of connections and making meaningful relationships with the people that you meet in the first place. Because if you go to an event and you, you just chat to people and just have a conversation with them, if they get on with you, then they're going to remember you. So if they do, if you come across somebody else, like a referral who's asked after your services, then if they've kept you in mind, they're most likely going to um, refer you because, you know, you got on well. So the key is about relationships. It's about connecting with the human being. It's not about, don't come from like a sales angle, you know, even though ultimately at the end you're trying to make sales. But the bigger thing is all about connections and and, and really connecting with your whoever you're talking to um, because you just don't know, you know, where they are on their journey. They could be a future client of yours. Um, once they get to know you, um, so they gotta they gotta get to know, like, and trust you, and that that's a key thing, and that's that's the same when it's online as well as offline. So that's why yeah, you've got that, of, you know, digital report. It's the same as being offline report, and you just create report online. Yeah, uh, yeah, you you read my mind there. It is about rapport, isn't it? It's like you know your discussion today could turn into um, an opportunity tomorrow, and if you are um, more open with what you have to offer and you're not being someone who's hiding it, 
then um, you know, pay me X, otherwise I won't tell you this. But if you're mm. willing to give knowledge away, and but then isn't there a balance between? Um, and we go back to this question, the second question, which was about there's only people that have got podcasts and blogs and stuff. It's about being careful about what you communicate um, and how you communicate. Do you mean um, giving away your content? You mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it's not it's not anything to worry about in that context. I, I explain why because everybody's got a different learning modality. You know, we we learn in different ways. Some are more visual, some are more kinesthetic, or some people are audi auditory. So you can technically be putting out the best quality content on a podcast, but only the people who are interested in podcasts are going to be listening to that content, right? So, um, and 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 the thing is, um, funnily enough, right? When you're living in the online world, it's all about numbers it's a numbers game statistics um and if you look at it like industry averages are around three percent conversion rates right and that's not a lot so that means for every hundred people that listen to your podcast three of them might try to get in touch with you that's not a huge number right no. if you look at it that way so um when you're putting content out there um the the idea is to be of service but then it's it's, it's the uh, ability to then use that content to you know, you almost create a, um, what you call like a following um, and a community of people who actually like to listen to what you have to say. And if they're, if they're resonating with what you're sharing with them, then you, like you said, they're gonna, you're going to be fresh on their mind. Now, again, it depends where that person is on their journey. So they might, whatever you might be sharing might just be like one element of a bigger picture. Right. And hearing something in isolation doesn't necessarily give you all the, all the kind of uh, pieces to a puzzle. You still have to figure out how these things work together. And most of the time what happens, right, is that because we're so in something, we don't realize that the person who's got no information or knowledge around this topic, they, ha they haven't got a clue. They're not going to know as much information as you. They're not going to be able to piece that information. Like 15 years of your knowledge is not going to be able to be pieced in like two minute conversation with someone, is it? Right. So when you look at it, how you're sharing your content, they're not going to necessarily get the pieces of all the puzzle. And that's why it's important to be fixing one thing at a time or sharing one thing at a time. So if you create content, if you're addressing one issue, one issue, one topic at a time, it's going to be easier to digest. It's going to be easier to implement and you're going to they're going to remember you. But if you bombard people with content, you know, it's going to be like, what's this person talking about? What's his speciality? How, how is he actually going to help me? Is this even relevant to me? Right. Um, and, and that's how you look at it, because, you you know, if you're afraid, uh, one of the secrets online is they say, just give away your content. Why are you afraid? Just give it away. Because if people, um, the mindset becomes that if this person's giving me away this free content, what's his paid content going to be like? <laughs> right. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? But it's not about that. It's about it's about the bigger picture and how things fit together. Like, um, for example, we, we, you know, when we're working with clients, we, if we're building websites for uh, clients, website is just is, is in our kind of methodology is just step six of a twelve step process, right? There's twelve things in total that need to be in place for a whole business to kind of work properly online, um, and a website step six. So before that, you got funnel creations, for example, you got branding, you got the business model, you've got the, what solution you got, your, then you got the niche and target industry as well. And then on the other side, you've got content creation, traffic, um, like PR, as you mentioned as well, networking and live events. So if you look at all of the things, all the pieces of the puzzle, you have to put them together in order to get the right pathway. Um, and that's what uh, is missing a lot of the time because, um, people just create noise on noise but no no pathway to get person from point a to point b so uh, how important do you think so you know we covered off uh, quite a lot actually i mean just to, to summarize for a second you know we're talking about the importance of content you know it's good to give it away it's good to be um more um open with it which is a which is a fundamental point uh, you never know when you meet somebody they, they may end up being your future client that was another point you made um but i wanted to ask you about quality right mm -hmm. how important is the quality of that content so i'll give an example i've been using a tool recently i mean i, I consider myself as one of the pioneers of podcasting and and i and i saw an advert i heard an advert recently with with this particular chat went oh it's so easy to do now and it is push button now it's it's literally push button you can do it on your phone and the quality of the smartphones are so good that you can do all kinds of stuff but ultimately 
Has it been structured well? Um, is there a, a clarity around who's going to be spoken to uh, and what kind of information that person's going to walk away with? And they want to be interested in coming back to you. The discipline behind every Friday, Funky Friday, is when that particular uh, episode comes out. It comes out every two weeks. You train the audience to, to look forward to it. But then the content itself, if it's poor and crackly and inaudible to a certain extent, that's a switch off, right? There has to be a minimum standard. Is your view that there has to be a minimum standard for this stuff about structure as well as how it's recorded? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'll give, I'll give you an example. So what happened was um, I was curious to see uh, what's going on uh, in, in the blog sphere online, right? So I took up a challenge, 90 day challenge to create content every single day for 90 days, right? Um, because um, one, one of the things with blog, blogs, for example, is that the quality of the content is 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 key. And it became quite apparent because um, when, when you look at it, I, I'll give you an example. Say you're looking for, uh, you're searching for something, you, you type in the search engine and you get these videos or you get uh, blogs, posts or websites come up right and and then you click through to those uh, uh, that content have a look at it and read it now in order for you to compete with that content right one it has to be better than what's out there already yeah and that should be a penny drop moment for a lot of people because the only way you're going to compete with it is because google's going to look at it and think is this content any good compared to this person who's written about the same topic right and if it's not it's going to be hard to even get a, a ranking and a listing. But then when you have that, you know, good quality content out there, it will, if you're generating that consistently, um, I'm not saying doing it every day, like I try to do for nine days kind of thing. Right. Um, because that can be a waste in itself as well. I got a whole little uh, thing around that. Um, but if the, if the quality isn't matching, then you're right. It's gonna, it's gonna, uh, you know, people are going to look at it and think, well, this person was writing better content. So why should I listen to that? or read that um and um if it is content that's good and quality people are going to share it more as well and if it gets shared then you start to get into this loop where google thinks okay it's being viewed it's being shared so it must be good so then it pushes you up as well right. you know the so, algorithm, um, the algorithm. it's very important yeah the algorithm um so let's talk about a few case studies because i know you've done some work with somebody who did some martial art type stuff and then they uh, took that concept and they put it into management, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, we mentioned the bike ride, um, the, which has been going for about 35 years, uh, the Saka team. Uh, and now the website is um, managed by your company. Tell us a few more case studies. We've got a, a three, three, four minutes left. Oh, oh where, do I <laughs> <laughs> where do I begin? I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's a lot. There's there's so many. I mean, if you take the martial arts one, right? Now, if you look at the, what's going on in this time at this moment, you know, lockdown, imagine what was happening with martial art classes, right? Um, no contact sport taking place. Um, so, you know, take, looking at the martial arts element of it, what we did with uh, a, a gentleman called Lakloy, Sifu Lakloy, right? You, who've, you've had on the show before as well, is that um, what, what he noticed was that, you know, the, what inspired us into martial arts was mind, body and spirit. We watched things like the Karate Kid, uh, uh, Bruce Lee and all these kind of things. And there was a hidden element. There was this kind of thing um, to do with the warrior within, which attracted us. Right. But nowadays what's happening is martial arts is more um, MMA type. It's just about the fight and, 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 and not the mindset kind of stuff around it. So one of the things he did was, well, why don't we try to bring that back and talk about it? So he's um, basically taken the philosophy, philosophical side of it and put it into a book, right? Which is a book called Master Your Mind. Um, and now that book talks about the martial mindset, but then using the martial mindset allows you to improve your martial arts because you're able to understand how your body works, right? That's an example of transferring your knowledge into a book format. But then alongside that, he's also got an online dojo. Right. So the online dojo has all of this content in video format. And then when he had to be when he was doing his um, normal classes, he was filming all of that content, putting it online into a closed area so that um, people could basically go online and learn it. Right. So it's about transferring that knowledge into a way that can be consumed in, in a digital format as, a, as an example. That's just one example. And I've got so many like that. We'll be here all night. <laughs> no, that's really good. And I think oh, sadly we've run out of time, actually. But um... 
I, I want to wish you all the best with uh, BigFanta.com and also the Digital Report, which is uh, on Facebook. It's a you know, great you know, champion effort to uh, get people ahead. And it's, it's, it kind of looks like a service, isn't it? It's like you know, you're helping other people become successful. Yeah, I mean, what, the reason it's, it's really good is because I've gone out there doing interviews with experts in the industry and talking to them about reports and just share, just tell us what is required to connect with people. So it's very, it's very good content on that side of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, thanks a lot for your time. I know you're a really busy person. You've got to get back to all those clients uh, and we look forward to uh, catching up later. And uh, I'll see you on the bike at some stage. Uh, right. Thank <laughs> you. We'll, we'll go for a ride. Yeah, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Good luck with all you do, yeah? Yeah. You too, my friend. Bye, you, Bye, you, Bye, you. Bye.